Hi, I'm Jay Goth. I'm the managing partner of Forentis Fund, www.forentis.com, and you are watching Ion Business. My name is Jose Jumphy, CEO of Chillhound.com, and you are watching Ion Business. Welcome back. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Ion Business. And with us this evening is Jay Goff. He is the founding and managing partner of the Forentis Fund. The Forentis Fund is focused on biotech with specifics in diagnostics and pharmaceuticals. Thank you so much for coming in this evening. I Kevin, thanks for having me. Much. I appreciate it. So we all know that medical advancements are, are going crazy. And take AI, machine learning, all the cool things in genomes. Um, so what is the focus in particular of the Forentis Fund? Well, as you may have noticed, there is a uh, crisis in healthcare. Uh, it's in the news once in a while, or maybe every day. Yeah. It's uh, too expensive. Uh, the healthcare system's broken. What we're really focusing on is the next advance in medicine, and that's precision medicine. Mm -hmm. And the key to precision medicine is knowing more about the patient so that you can tailor therapies or diagnostics to that individual instead of to a group. So when you say knowing more, does that mean pulling their genome and trying to focus special drugs towards that direct genome? I mean, what do you mean specifically for those that are watching? You're on the right track. Uh, genomics is one of the things that you look at. But you know, when you think about it, your gene expressions will tell you a lot about what's going on with that patient. Mm -hmm. But what is causing those gene expressions to change? It could, it could be a protein. It could be a metabolite. There are a lot of different things floating around in our bodies that can affect uh, a disease state or a response to a drug. So what we're trying to do is go beyond the genome and look at all of the different omic modalities. So would that also include some of the, the cultural issues, environment, who they're associated with, what they do? That, is that the type of stuff also that would be included? Right. So you want to include, you know, if you can, what they're eating, with their nutrition, mm -hmm. what they're breathing, you know, what kind of air pollution they're living in. Somebody living in Beijing is going to have a different experience than somebody living in Iowa. So you want to take all those things into account as much as you can get. You can even include scans like CT scans mm -hmm. or x-rays, imaging, stuff like that. As much information as you can pull on a patient, the more ammunition you have to go look for a specific uh, cure or diagnostic for that patient. So what we're trying to do is look at as much data as possible. And obviously, when you're pulling that kind of data, you get a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So that's the next big challenge in medicine, right, is how do we take the technological advances we've made in computation and apply them to medicine. So that's one of the key areas that we focus on. We think that we've kind of cracked the code on basically sifting out all the stuff that doesn't matter and finding the true, we call them biomarkers, but they're clues in the human biology that will give us an adequate reading on what's going on with that particular individual. So you say that you're focused on pharmaceuticals. I mean, from the last time I looked at the subject that, you know, we're looking at what, 10, 12 years to get a drug to market and something like two plus billion dollars. Um, right. Do you feel like this is going to help reduce that, that expense and, and shorter, shorten the time to market? Is that part of your goal? That is part of it. Uh, we're not going to be developing therapeutics ourselves. Uh, okay. You know, we're a small fund, a bunch of startup guys. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is look at how can we enable other companies to do it more efficiently. So I think uh, part of precision medicine is developing what's called companion diagnostics. So when you go into clinical trials, if you can enroll patients in the trials that you know are going to respond ahead of time positively, then you can get much better numbers. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, you're going to have to do the same thing, use that same screening criteria when you're deciding whether or not to put that drug to use in the real world. 
but all of a sudden you're really getting to the precision medicine part of the whole thing and I think that can really shorten clinical trial times down, increase uh, patient enrollment because you have to enroll fewer people. Yeah. And so basically what we're going to do is bring the cost of drug development down through these types of uh, advances. So we just came back from AI Med, which was the one of the first multimodality um, conferences on artificial intelligence and medicine. And one of the things they raised was the whole point of being able to better fit the patient to the solution before you actually know fully what's wrong with them, but at least have a better class of understanding about who they are, what's wrong with them, and so on. Um, are you using big data to, to narrow down who might fit that drug trial? Is that what you're basically saying that you're doing? Exactly. Uh, we have a laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania that uses mass spectrometers and RNA sequencing machines to pull data from tissue samples. Mm -hmm. And right now we're looking at about 250 million data points. Wow. And that's a lot of data. And how do you find there might be only three or four biomarkers in all that data that is actually affecting the outcome of whatever you're studying. Mm -hmm. How do you find those? That's the big data approach. How do you sift that down? How do you take all that data and really find the truth and all the noise that's floating out there in that data? And that's what that's one of our core strengths, I think. So have you thought about integrating the EHR data across the platform and pulling in patient data from all over the place to make these correlations, or are you doing that in a narrow subset? Uh, right now we're doing it in a narrow subset. Obviously the future is going to be the more data you can access the better right uh, so totally you know that. you want to go to that so you're seeing all kinds of collaborations NIH has uh, you know the precision medicine initiative mm -hmm. you've got a lot of things going on where people are starting to talk to each other but the medical industry is like almost every other industry it's really siloed yeah, it's so how do you break down yeah 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 um, any early successes that you feel like you know you can tout that that are, are exciting for the public to, to know yeah, we've uh, been working with a gentleman at NYU who has developed a liquid biopsy for lung adenocarcinoma. Wow, okay. And so right now, if uh, you see a mass in your lung, they go in through your armpit and do what they call a needle biopsy, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you don't need a biopsy, so you're having unnecessary surgery. You're subject to risk and all the complications Infections that develop, else, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. And then if it is a cancerous mass, you've just punctured it, and now, now you've got spread. some of that stuff metastasizing throughout your body. For those that don't understand, when you puncture a, a tumor, it can actually allow it to um, travel in a way that if it's tightly encapsulated, it, it, not always, but it tends to control the spread in some, some forms of cancer. So. Right. So this gentleman is a lung oncologist. He does biopsies every day, and he said there's got to be a better way. So he developed a liquid biopsy That's cool. that was very effective, but it wasn't to the accuracy that he wanted to achieve. So what we were able to do was take the data that he had developed on his own using uh, an RNA sequencing machine and find the biomarkers that would actually tell us whether or not that mass was metastatic or benign. Mm -hmm. And we were able to Which bring is a his... Big deal we were able to bring that accuracy rate up to 100% on oh, 282 okay. patients. Wow. And then we did another 100 uh, patient double blind study, a validation study, and we came out with almost the same accuracy. So all of a sudden now you're no longer guessing at whether someone really needs treatment because sometimes the treatment is deadlier than the disease, right? Exactly. And if you have a benign tumor, the last thing you want to do is be treating someone as if it's malignant for sure. So that, right. that is pretty neat stuff. Um, in the couple minutes that we have left, can you give me a little bit, I mean, you're clearly someone who's been in the, the investment world and dealing with some of the things. What, where do you see what you're doing going in the next few years? Well, I'll tell you, I've been uh, an investment banker. I've worked on a lot of exciting projects, but nothing has gotten me more excited than what we're doing today. I mean, this is a chance to really change the direction of medicine in a positive way, help get more cures out to more people faster. The FDA is all about... You know, everyone in the drug industry always complains about the FDA, but the fact is they're there for a reason, but they want to start using technology to advance medicine. And I think combining medicine with technology in new and innovative ways is going to drive a whole new paradigm shift, and ultimately it's going to result in a better medical care experience for everybody. So let me ask one final question. Um, 
I always like to see if there's something that someone's watching that might help you or the folks that are in the fight that you're in get what you need. So if you were king for a day and you could get anything in the way of getting the FDA out of the way, whatever it might be, what would that be in today's, if you had the choice today? Well, being a fund manager, I'm raising funds for my company. Uh, so anybody that's interested can go to forentist.com uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we are a, a general solicitation uh, offering so anybody can go on look at the stuff we're totally transparent if they want to invest capital is really the resource that we need the most we've got the technology we've got an excellent medical advisory board we're partnering up with some of the top people in the in the world on on this kind of stuff but always for entrepreneurs, capital is one of the biggest uh, hurdles you have to overcome. Well, Jay, I really want to thank you for coming in and talking with us. It's been Thanks, amazing. Kevin. It's been educating. It's been fun. And, and hopefully you'll come back as, as things progress. I would I'd love to fill you in on our newest and latest. Fantastic. You've been watching Eye on Business. And with us has been Jay Goff, the managing partner of Forentis Fund. And we hope you'll come back. I'm Kieran Foley, CEO of Immersive Entertainment at immersiveentertainment.com, and you're watching Eye on Business. Welcome back. You're with Kevin McDonald. You're watching Eye on Business, and with us this evening is Kieran Foley, the CEO of Immersive Entertainment. Kieran has actually been with us once before, but they've actually made some really good strides in their business, and I want to let him explain to you first the difference between VR and AR, because that's the business they're in. Thanks for coming in. Hey, thank you for having us. Thanks. So for those that are watching, um, your company does uh, advanced technology in this virtual world, but I'd like you to explain first what's the difference between VR and AR. Yeah, so it's pretty simple. In VR, you're placed within a digital world. Uh, the the outside world is by and large you know blocked off from you and in AR you're essentially having digital hallucinations the digital world is brought into your world mm. okay so um, I understand that some of the goggles and enhancements can also be a way of having that happen so you're driving a car and you have your your MPG or miles per, per hour at, in, in the glasses. Is that accurate? It is, and you know that represents what a lot of the thinking today is in terms of user interface, mm -hmm. uh, but we actually think it's going to be something very different that you experience in augmented reality and even virtual reality as well. So let's pick one for now. Which one would you prefer to discuss first? Yeah, so for us right now, the focus is on VR, okay. virtual reality, where All you're right. placed. So in. what does immersive entertainment do in the world of VR? So we're building the world's leading virtual engagement platform. Uh, that's a bunch of fancy words that really mean that we're, lear we're seeking to understand how people interface, how they work in a virtual environment, um, as, such that they can be more productive, they can be better entertained, and of course, from a business perspective, if you can do that, uh, then you make more money. You end up engaging the users and end up converting as well. So I've been reading a lot about it in the last year, um, about how the market is starting to mature. So was 2016 really the year of VR, or is it just the beginning? No, that's a good question. Um, actually, from our perspective, it really wasn't. Uh, the, the, the industry is so nascent, so young. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a ways to go. Um, but from a VR's perspective, perspective, we think 2017 is where you're going to start seeing some consumer adoption. Uh, a lot of users were waiting for the first generation of HMDs or head-mounted displays to come on the market. Uh, and in 2017, also, you're going to see some software companies getting their legs as well. So, you know, we can all imagine virtual reality and VR being gaming, but it, there's so much more to it than that. So why don't you give the audience a little bit of an idea of what they can look forward to in the future, say the next decade or so. Sure. Well, for VR, um, you know, the possibilities are limitless. VR is going to be relegated largely to gaming initially, uh, but certainly vertical market applications where you want to truly immerse the user within an environment fully, mm -hmm. whether they be solo or with other people. Uh, and, and, you know, when you look at opportunities here, it's really a blank slate. It's a blank reality. Uh, so you can build anything that you could build in the real world within the virtual world. And so, therefore, the applications are endless. Um, with respect to AR, you're looking at a tail of probably three years. So AR is where VR was three years ago right oh, now. Okay. And with respect to AR, we see probably a 10 to 20 uh, fold increase uh, over VR in terms of opportunity. Um, AR is what will eventually eat mobile or your mobile phone. Mm -hmm. 
So augmented reality is AR, and, and for those that, that are not clear on virtual reality is three-dimensional view of something other than reality. You're right? stepping into the data. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I can imagine everything from personalized vacations and doctors doing surgery virtually. I mean, I've read all kinds of interesting things, but what makes immersive entertainment exciting to yeah. those that are going to support you and purchase your product in the future? So the way we looked at the marketplace was we knew that people were experimenting with long-form narratives, telling stories in VR, and they were also playing with uh, taking existing paradigms and gaming and bringing them to VR. Mm -hmm. But we took a step back, almost like a child does, and looked at the market with a sort of pure eyes and realized that VR really brings something magical that no other technology can, and that is if you remember back to Star Trek and the holodeck experience, mm -hmm. the ability to actually have a sense of presence, to be somewhere completely different and function within an environment that has persistence, that has your friends or not, has the ability to, um, to morph in the way that you uh, have an effect or an influence in it, is really powerful. So we decided to go along that path, and in so doing, we created a... Um, uh, an experience called the Grand Canyon VR experience, put it out into the marketplace, and now, now we have over tens of thousands of users using it right now uh, and experiencing this level of presence that they've never experienced before. So uh, for those that are familiar with three-dimensional games and things like that, what's interesting about what I understand you guys are doing is that it is truly about presence. It's about sensing someone standing behind you even though you can't see them. Right, and right. And things like that in ways that only the human experience can have. That's correct. But I also know that you folks have created something that doesn't make you sick in the way that many of these devices, for me, that's very important, by the way. Um, so you, you've actually resolved some of the issues with uh, motion sensitivity. We have. We've spent the last three years doing some pretty heavy R&D and technical work on solving key problems. One of them is locomotion. You know, How do you move around an environment that is virtually uh, larger than your living room, if you will, and do that in a way that doesn't make you nauseous? Um, there are a number of other problems, but all of solving those problems all leads to this sense of, persist uh, of, of um, immersion, if you will, and presence. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that's the, the ultimate problem to solve. And uh, so along those lines, our commercial titles really are being used to experiment, uh, to generate revenues, obviously, and get users' feedback. Uh, but, yeah, ultimately, yeah, but ultimately, <laughs> um, the learning that we're doing with those titles is being used to create an engine. And that engine will allow developers, other developers, to be able to create titles that have uh, an enormous sense of presence. And that's really ultimately where the value is. So you see both be. the retail and a licensing model. And, Absolutely. And even yes. potentially an experiential model. Yes. Right? Yeah. And in fact, you, you mentioned uh, virtual tourism, in effect. And, and that is the number one desired uh, um, goal of VR for many users, yeah. even above gaming. Well, when I first saw your tool, the first thing I thought was, wow, how cool would it be to be someone who's stuck in a wheelchair or unable to tramble because they're, they don't have the money and That's to be right. able to go into the equivalent of an internet cafe and actually experience Africa or something. I mean, how cool would that be? Yeah, we think, we think that these experiences are going to open up a whole new world of existence for a lot of people who have been sort of marginalized. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be an aging population. It can be people with disabilities. And, and, uh, and, and let's face it, you know, there are a lot of people in the world who are not going to make it to one of the seven wonders of the world or experience certain things that are too dangerous. So this well, is their and, opportunity. You know, from that perspective in business, I had the... the the pleasure and the displeasure at the same time, anyway, of traveling to many states in the country. And it gives you a very different view of the world when yes. you see true poverty in Appalachia versus true poverty in the city in Detroit. Or They're the same and they're different in, in, on so many levels. And the beauty of, of Virginia woods and the mountains of, of Tennessee and these kind of things. So I really can see that it also may actually change the cultural opinions of folks because they've seen it now in a way that they never could watching TV. You know, VR has demonstrated its capability and power in terms of being a tool for empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you take that empathy and you inject it into a world that has true presence, where you really feel like you get a sense as to the context in which people are living, and then you enable multiplayer. So now you have real people in there with you, the doors open widely. You, totally you can have all that. sorts of different experiences. Yeah, I can totally yeah. see that. So. Um, I know that you're a startup and you've raised some, some money. And what's next for you? Yeah, so for us, from a, a, a business standpoint, we've raised about $400,000 through friends and family and angel That's investment. A small amount of money. Yeah, we're, we're doing a small bridge currently, and we're working our way towards a, a Series A this year. Fantastic. So. Well, I hope that you'll keep in touch with us. How can folks learn more about Immersive Entertainment? Really simple. Just go to immersiveentertainment.com. 
Well, thank you, Kieran, for coming. My pleasure. Really thank you. Thanks it. for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Kevin McDonald. You're watching Ion Business, and with us has been Kieran Foley, the CEO of Immersive Entertainment. And thank you for watching. Good afternoon, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. I want to welcome Ron DeShore. So I got your name right this time. <laughs> nice to be here, David. I appreciate uh, you coming on board. Uh, do me a favor, share a little about your background. Well, basically I think I was born talking, so I wrote a book called The Two Minute Networker several years ago and then got involved with LinkedIn. I'm a serial entrepreneur that basically believes the two things you need to do to be successful are talk to strangers and master the F word, follow up. Oh, I mean, I'm from New York. The <laughs> F word means something totally different to me. But free is the F word for me. I mean, I was in the, anyway. Anyway, um, I want to talk about social media and particularly LinkedIn because a lot of the viewers use LinkedIn as a basic business tool. So let's talk about LinkedIn. Is that all right? Absolutely. All right. So in LinkedIn, one of the first things that people look at when they, you know, sign on is a profile. Yes. How can a person make that profile really strong so they can be found in a way that makes sense to them? So that's a great question. The first thing you want to do is have a professional photo. You want to have that background that's in back of you. You actually want to use that to put your keywords, your phone number, how people can find you. And you want to have a summary that tells people who you are, what you do, what other people think of you, and how they can find you and you want to optimize it with the right words. All right, so if I were looking at a summary, are you suggesting they put their email and their telephone number up there in a positioning statement like I am a social media and LinkedIn maven, something like that? Something or? like that, but usually what I suggest is you start with a question, which might be, are you a CEO, an entrepreneur, whoever your audience happens to be? Ask the question and point to the point of pain of what they do, and then let them know what you do. Okay, great. Now, when you're on LinkedIn, you have the profile. The second thing you're going to do is try to build relationships. What's the best way to use LinkedIn to build relationships? Well, I'm actually going to go back to the first question, which is make sure your profile is absolutely complete. Because if you are going to reach out to somebody you don't know, that first impression, when they look at your profile, is going to decide whether they're going to accept that invitation or not. Ah, uh, okay. Now, Let's say that I don't want to have everybody linked into me. I mm -hmm. want to know, personally, I want to know the people that I deal with on LinkedIn, or at least I have met them. Okay. What's the best way for me to use LinkedIn to build the relationship? What other things can I do on LinkedIn, or what groups should I join, or how do I use groups? But how do I use LinkedIn really to get to build this relationship? So you, you said a very good question. You said people that you know. How many people do you meet during the course of a day when you're offline that you don't connect with online? So the first step is okay. actually to, I met you at an event, Correct. Send, you an ev send you a personal invitation that said, David, it was great meeting you at the event in Orange County. I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn and learn how I can be a resource for you. Yeah, but you also did one other thing. You asked me my color. I Why did. did you do that? Well, the color was actually on a form that I use. When I give out, when I do a talk, I hand out a form to everybody that basically allows them to opt into my newsletter and right. various other things. Well, if, when I call you back, you may not remember that you filled out that form. But when I tell you that your favorite color is coral or blue, you're gonna, you smile immediately yeah. and you remember me. Yeah. So it's well, a great I, tool. You know, it's funny because I knew my color was blue because that's what I like. And here I'm wearing a coral color shirt. I should have worn blue for this interview. <laughs> it would have made more sense. It's a great way to just remember people. And even when you're doing the personalized LinkedIn invitation, reference something that you talked about when you send that invitation to the person that you met, even if you met them standing at Starbucks. Well, I think you just hit, on a, to me, an important point because you can go on LinkedIn and, re, and add contacts, add connections. Absolutely. And you can say, I, I, would like to, you, uh, I would like you to join my LinkedIn network and that's it. That's not very personalized. No. But you can do it in other ways. So you're an advocate of doing a very custom invitation absolutely. so you can build this relationship, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because why would you take, get an invitation from somebody that you don't know when it's just click, send, and then... 
right. says they didn't put any time or thought into it. Do you really want to let that person into your network? No, nope. and yeah. I don't. I mean, I have a lot of people just sitting around there because, you know, they just sit around there because I don't know who they are, and I don't know if they just want to use me for my contacts, and I'd really like to build a relationship because I do think it's very valuable. Absolutely. So let me flip around. There's two things on the home page. There's a status Mm -hmm. Bar yes. or status, you know, click. That's an update. An update. Okay. Status. How do you use that to build a relationship? What would you recommend? Well, one of the things, and I recommend using that often. It's a way you, if you found something that you liked that you wanted to share with people, put that in there. I found an article yesterday that said 52 facts that you probably don't know, and I shared it, and I got a lot of comments on that. So it's a way where people are following you they actually see things that are interesting and then they continue to follow you so they want to look at it. So put interesting things in there that are about other people, not about you. Yeah, I use that by the way. I, I'm a big fan of quotes from people. I'm yep. a Sun Tzu fan, for example. And I send out <clears throat> on my status bar, uh, status updates, you know, quotes. Yep. People seem to like that more than anything else I put together. But the other component on your home page is the publishing part. Pulse. How can you use publishing to Pulse really build your reputation? Pulse is a great platform. If you can put some original content out and put it out about once a week and tag it appropriately, okay. what you want to have is a premium membership. You want to pay for it because if you really want to get something from LinkedIn, take a look at the people that like your posts and share your posts. And then there's this old-fashioned app. It's called the phone. Yep. Pick, pick it up and call the person and say, I noticed that you shared my article on Pulse. What did you like about it? And start a dialogue with that person. It's amazing what will happen. All right. I wanted to ask one final question because there's a new tool, you know, called Sales Navigator. Good, bad, indifferent, useful, useful I love for Sales people. Navigator. And the reason is LinkedIn's platform from the desktop version is merging over to a new interface, which looks like your mobile interface. Got it. So, without LinkedIn Sales Navigator, when they take away all of your advanced search functions, you're going to be very, very lost. And LinkedIn Sales Navigator is really awesome. Just have a little bit of a learning curve. Well, great. Listen, I, I appreciate you coming um, uh, on board today and uh, sharing your thoughts on LinkedIn. Final thing, I'll, le I'll leave it to you. What are the three things people should do with LinkedIn? Number one, make sure they have a complete profile. Okay. Very important. Number two, put your contact information in your summary. Got it. Very, very important. And the third thing, spend about 15 minutes every day on LinkedIn. Oh, I like that. Because you know what? If you're not LinkedIn, you're left out. I'll leave it like that. Well, thank you very much for joining. This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. Have a good evening. To watch this. They're going to get me two, all set, three, and then I'm going to move intentionally. Four or five. Yeah, right. There we go. There we go. See, I just did it again. It's fantastic. What are we talking about again? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are we here for? <laughs> what company am I representing? Uh, oh, so I am business? Okay, you sure? <laughs> <laughs>